Welcome to this introductory lecture on Gerald of Wales, his book, A History and Topography of Ireland. Here's a little informal quiz just to whet your interest in our study of Gerald of Wales's History and Topography of Ireland. What place might be being described here where we can see a goat who has sex with a woman, a man who was half an ox and an ox that was half a man? A wolf who talks with a priest about religious matters. A fish with 50 ounces worth of gold teeth in its mouth. Men who go naked and unarmed into battle. An island where no woman or female animal could enter without dying immediately. Another island where no one ever died a natural death. A place where no serpents or snakes, toads or frogs, tortoises or scorpions, and... Last but not least, also there were no dragons. A land where we can find a book written at the dictation of an angel. This is Ireland, of course, as described by Gerald of Wales, whose text we're going to be reading in subsequent class periods. Also shown, there's Ireland. If you can make out the strange medieval hand as well as the Latin, it says Hibernia. We also see... Britannia, Islandia, so Iceland, and Francia, so uh, one of the kingdoms that now is part of present-day France. So we see Flanders as well. So uh, keep in mind that this is the late 12th century or so, and the countries don't look exactly as they do uh, today in terms of what um, comprises them. And as you know from last class period, this map is quote unquote, not going to be accurate in our sense of the word. I talked about um, TO maps and Mapamundi. This would be known as a portorial map in that we just see the coasts of the different lands and some general blockings of where they are. So here we see uh, Scotland in the northern part of the, the what is the UK today. So not an accurate rendition of distances and not really detailed. It would just give you a sense of where uh, these lands approximately were for um, the purposes of travelers. Let's learn a tiny bit about Gerald of Wales before thinking more broadly both about medieval travel literature, that is the genre in which he's working, as well as English and Irish history at this time. So he makes his first trip to Ireland in 1183 and the second in 1185 at the request of King Henry II. Before him, Wonders of the East was a popular theme in medieval travel writing, and I would suggest that his book chronicles more Wonders of the West. So as we learned uh, in a previous lecture, yeah, England is at the uh, northwest outpost of the Roman Empire. And then we have Ireland, which is even farther west than England. So uh, the marvels that we see described in uh, travel narratives about the east, they are similar yet different than those that Gerald describes. I um, cherry picked a few there for that opening slide. Here is a very brief look at Wonders of the East as it is known, a text written uh, written down in the mid 11th century. So um, probably the legends uh, surrounding these creatures um, existed before this. And we find this text in the same uh, manuscript as uh, the poem known as Beowulf. So what are these creatures that we have here um, on the top? That is an elephant. So it's just drawn to look kind of strange. Uh, they don't have English, um, elephants in Western Europe and for sure in England too. What do we got at the bottom? Is that an animal that we know and it's just drawn somewhat unrecognizably? No, this is a strange creature that allegedly lives in the Far East, a Blemi, uh, and there are many, 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 many other creatures like this one uh, that you, you know that this is you know entirely fiction. My point here is 
uh, is that travel narratives often mix together fact with fiction. Uh, here we have an elephant, and uh, you know, just a few page later, pages later, we have these strange creatures, men who have their faces beneath their shoulders. So um, a couple of observations here. One, this is perhaps what gives rise to the present day belief that medieval people put credence in uh, creatures such as dragons and unicorns um, because they are cheek by jowl alongside of other animals that are um, familiar and known to us. And indeed, why would we have an animal like an elephant alongside of these fantastic creatures? Well, they would have been exotic uh, to a Western European uh, slash English audience. Here is another legend from the East that I mentioned the last time, the Dragon Lady of Lango. Uh, this excerpt is taken from Chapter 4 of Mandeville's Travels, which was composed in the late 14th century, so a few clicks ahead in history from the Wonders of the East. So here's the Dragon Lady's story. Incidentally, she, according to Mandeville, is Hippocrates' uh, daughter, and she lives off of an island in, in Greece. And she was thus changed and transformed from a fair damsel into likeness of a dragon by a goddess that was called Diana. And men say that she shall so endure in that form of a dragon until the time that a knight come that is so hardy, so, so stalwart and brave, that dare come to her and kiss her on the mouth. And then she turn again to her own kind and be a woman again but after that she shall not live long so uh yeah probably not a true story but uh, i'm not alone in thinking that it maybe provides grist uh for the connection in game of thrones between the targaryen family and the power that they get from some kind of lineage with dragons so I mentioned John Mandeville as an example because he includes this legend of the Dragon Lady of Lango. Um, maybe this is some sort of inspiration for the Targaryen family's connection with dragons. And as we learn, uh, Daenerys Targaryen's particular connection with dragons. Uh, but John Mandeville, he is both a good and, quote unquote, not good example of medieval travel writing. Because he himself never, never traveled anywhere, except maybe his local library. He based his travel narrative, which is written down in the late 14th century, on others such as Marco Polo's. The bottom line on medieval travel narratives, especially ones to the East, is that they focus on truths rather than facts. And so um, the East is very, very, very far away from Western Europe, um, especially at this time when travel is not so easy as it is today. And so Westerners can project onto the East all kinds of legends and fears and fantasies, um, even in that little excerpt that you read about the dragon lady you can see how clearly there's some kind of threat about female sexuality that if you were going to read more from john mandeville you'd see it in um take on other forms um a really famous one is women who live in the far east who have snakes coming out of their vaginas and so um the vagina is being something that's you know, potentially threatening and even castrating to men is a fear that uh, Sigmund Freud talked about. So not that that makes it true, but it is uh, a classic anxiety that here from the Western perspective is projected onto these faraway peoples, in particular women. So uh, Gerald is writing about 200 years before John Mandeville. They're in a similar tradition. Uh, so I, I have felt I could make some connections between them. Uh, and like John Mandeville, Gerald did not travel extensively in Ireland. Your introduction notes um, the many places that he did not visit, although his travel narrative um, describes lots of places very extensively. And additionally, he does not rely much on other written uh, sources, uh, so that makes him unlike John Mandeville. He says that he uh, relies on God's grace in order to compose his uh travel narratives so you think yeah a very 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 loose relationship with sources he's not interested in conveying um facts as 
you know, we would expect in a travel um, or historical narrative. And to my mind, um, he mentions that he relies on oral reports from the native Irish people themselves, and these storytellers must have enjoyed winding up this naive traveler with their tall tales. Um, little do we know that uh, some of them that you saw um, earlier in this lecture about the man who turned into a, an ox and the ox who uh, was part man, uh, etc. There are many, many more like that. Yeah, that they would come to suggest the strangeness of the Irish people, um, whereas, yeah, they were just local legends meant for uh, entertainment purposes. I'm just going to draw a very rough and ready distinction between metal, medieval travel narratives and what we might call early modern ones or renaissance ones uh renaissance doesn't really capture it i prefer the term early modern to describe the age of exploration that um encapsulates the years 1500 to 1800 when western europe discovers quote unquote the quote unquote new world so many medieval travel narratives uh attend to religious locations um they are accounts of pilgrimages so uh the holy land and rome are a couple of very big ones i would say santiago de compostela in spain um, there is a thousand mile pilgrimage route leading up to um, that church dedicated to uh, the apostle james in england of course we have uh, the canterbury shrine uh, set up for thomas beckett as well as um, a shrine at walsingham where the virgin mary uh, made a number of appearances we don't yet see travel for the purpose of conquest per se. Um, these crop up in the age of exploration uh, post-Columbus, European discovery of the new world. So uh, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, uh, but just to distinguish them briefly right here, these early modern travel narratives tend to describe the land and the people as very pliable and appealing and pleasing. Um, the land is very robust and ready to be tilled, and um, the native peoples are naive and a little bit rough around the edges. On the one hand, they will have an uh, innate goodness. On the other hand, there's suggestion that they would benefit from Western European influences. So again, we see fantasies from Western Europe projected onto these other peoples. Uh, Gerald's text is a notable exception for reasons that you'll uh, soon see. So I do think that his text is meant to advertise um, quote unquote colonization and imperialism in Ireland. Uh, as I say here, it's meant to endorse English conquest of Ireland. We're going to talk a bit about uh, Ireland and more than just a bit. Here is the just so story behind Pope Gregory's special mission to the English to Christianize them after they had quote unquote slipped back into their pagan ways under the influence of the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes, the Germanic invaders who came in the mid fifth century. Uh, Pope Gregory uh, beholds some fair haired children in a Roman marketplace and asks where they've come from. So this is obviously not a medieval picture. It's a more modern day cartoon, but there's Pope Gregory and there are the children. So he asks where they're from and they are identified as Angles, so they've come from Britannia, and this is the particular tribe that they are members of. So Gregory, so we are told, says, non Angli said Angeli, so not Angles, but angels. So allegedly the sight of these innocent, sweet, and gorgeous children inspires him to send evangelists in the year 597 to re-Christianize Britain because he sees that they are diamonds in the rough, so to speak, that they're not angles, but angels. We are going to think now about how this identity as angels, uh, whom Gregory sent a special evangelistic mission to convert, uh, how this plays into the English people's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world. So I'm going to travel over to have a, an interactive look at the Hereford world map, um, which is something that I introduced last time. Um, and 
in that beautiful mess that you see there, we are going to see where the English people are located. The Hereford Mapa Mundi is available online for any and all to access and look at. So I thought I'd show you how um, I get there. Um, there is its web address, and I'll link this into our Blackboard page as well, just for your reference. It is located in the Hereford Cathedral, which is where the map was thought to originate. And I wanted to show you in real time how I got there. Uh, so excuse me if I have a few stutter steps here. Map of Mundi about a third away down the page. Yeah, so let's start exploring. Um, get this map up. A few things of note that you are already familiar with. So it's a world map that's shaped like a disc. So hence the idea uh, that medieval people thought that the world was flat. Uh, at the top, you can't see this right now. We'll home in on a few of these places. But there is Christ in majesty and below him the Garden of Eden. Yeah, they're popped up Eden, helpfully. So, you know, I'm not making this up. Yeah, there's Christ in majesty. In the center of the map is Jerusalem, as I mentioned last time. And we'll have a look at that. It's shaped like a wheel. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is that many exotic peoples and exotic animals tend to be on the margins of the map. So right in the center is Jerusalem. Oops, I think we've got... Yeah, Rome, I knew it was um, somewhat close to the center, and uh, we're not going to look at that one um, close up, but you are free to do so, which is why I'm showing you uh, this in real time. Uh, Paris is over here, and Hereford is quite close to the edge of the map. So, again, this map is not accurate in the way that we would think a map would be accurate. It's allegorical, and it tells a story of cultural geography so things that are thought to be quote-unquote marginal are on the margins of the map um which makes us think gee what about christ in majesty majesty and eden way at the top of the map the easternmost point of the map well they are so marginal that they are extraordinary and supernatural and you know, uber important so um different definitions of marginal things which i mentioned in a previous lecture so you have both you know, unicorns and dog-headed people, but then additionally, um, spectacular things like Christ in Majesty and the Garden of Eden. Let's have a closer look here at, uh, well, we'll home in on, I mentioned Christ in Majesty, so this is where he lives on the map. And then the Garden of Eden also toward the east on the map. There's so many things uh, to dig into. This is why I um, am showing you this in in real time. Yeah, so Beasts of the World, the elephant, there's a close-up look at it. And it's also in the East where, um, from a Western European perspective, yeah, elephants are uh, sort of exotic. As I showed you in that Wonders of the East text, they're cheek by jowl alongside of you know, exotic animals, uh, but yeah, they would have been exotic to the Western European imagination. How about the unicorn? So yeah, in a marginal place of a different, of a different sort, I think we're looking down right there on the, the map, but we've moved, uh, I guess, due, due south, but we're still in a marginal part of the, um, the map, and there's a close-up picture of this chappie over here. I like strange peoples of the world. So remember, I mentioned the um, Blemes, who are a quote unquote wonder of the, the East. So this uh, dark circle is the outermost uh, edge of the map that circumscribes the disc within. There is the group of people who have got their head beneath their shoulders. So interestingly, there's so much to look at. Let's look at towns and cities. How about a close-up of Jerusalem? As I've said before, often depicted in terms of like a gear or a wheel. So here is uh, 
Jerusalem there on the map, and there it is um, in its actual location right in the center. Uh, Hereford is way over at the edge of uh, the map, so even um, the cathedral itself was thought to be erased from the map or rubbed off as um, this helpful note says I think that this sounds right that um, some medieval artifacts will be damaged not because they were you know meant to be effaced in a um, violent uh, kind of way but more like they were lovingly touched in a devotional way by um, visitors to the uh, visitors to the cathedral and yeah, if it's um, the map is housed there in Hereford Cathedral, people might say, oh, yeah, there's my hometown or oh, yeah, this is kind of like you are here. Uh, so I hope you do look at this map a little bit more. I'll widen back out to show you for context. So over here, we had the Bly Maze and elephants over there. I think unicorns were somewhere. Uh, yeah, you know, closer to you, certainly not in the center of the map uh, where um where Jerusalem is, but way over here is where we have Hereford, and um, Ireland would be even farther west of, of that. It's um, not marked with a, a distinctive um, you know, tab that you can click on to learn more, but if you were to pour over the map, I'm, I'm sure you'd be able to, uh, to find it if you're interested. As I ask here, who are the angels at the edge of the world? So, of course, they're the English people who, uh, because of the pun on their name, Angles and Angels, uh, imagined that the evangelistic mission that Pope Gregory sent uh, to Britannia to convert um, the English people uh, back to Christianity, uh, that maybe it was something like, you know, Christ with the lost sheep that he sends these missionaries in the year 597 as a you know, special effort to include them in, in Christendom. So uh, the English people in a lot of their literature describe themselves as um, exceptional for being way at the edge of the map. So we're not like those blimes who are strange looking people who have you know faces in the middle of their stomach. We're special in an extraordinary good way. So yeah, this often gets quoted as a um, otherworldly or supernatural kind of marginality. So on the map, we see indeed that there are strange things that hang out on the margins. If you dig further into the Hereford Mapamundi, you'll even see um, the Sinocephali. So the um, dog-headed people, I mean, it's uh, really the margins of the map are where all of the action is at. But we also saw that yeah, up on the easternmost point at the top of the map is where we find the Garden of Eden and Christ himself sitting atop all of it. So the margins are both threatening and strange and dangerous, but then also uh, you know, extraordinarily religious. So this raises a really sticky question that we see explode in Gerald of Wales's text. So um, Ireland, if we're playing this marginality game that, yeah, you know, being out in the margins can be good because you can be extraordinary and exceptional like we English people. Uh, gee, Ireland is even more marginal. Um, additionally, it had never been part of the Roman Empire. So, uh, yes, they are also kind of you know wild and untamed and even you know, independent, so to speak. So do we imagine in Game of Thrones politics are the... English people kind of like the Starks that they are, you know, way the heck out there, but they're still part of the realm. And then are the Irish people like the Wildings and indeed like wild Irish is a um, term of derision um, ascribed to them throughout the, the Middle Ages. Uh, because, yeah, with many, many things, they just march to a beat of a different drummer. So uh, never part of the Roman Empire. They had um, had Christian saints and been Christian before Gregory's conversion of the Anglo-Saxons. So recall that uh, England had been Christian under Roman rule, but had quote unquote slipped back into their pagan um, practices thanks to the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes, the Germanic invaders. But the Irish don't have that particular cultural issue. They don't have those um, Germanic tribes invading them. So yeah, they are you know, in line with Christianity, so way out on the margins, but yet, yeah, exceptional in a quote-unquote good way that they, they're known as the Isle of Saints and Sages. So, yeah, where do we put 
them in this um, margins versus center game or, you know, good margins versus bad margins. This is definitely the key game that we see being played out in Gerald of Wales's text. So I'd like to consider the issue of English marginality uh, in a bit of a different vein and think about England being, quote unquote, on edge. So Gerald first visits Ireland in 1183, and then he goes there in 1185 at the behest of King Henry II. Uh, and relatively recently, England has been conquered in the Norman invasion, which happened just a century before. So a few generations, if you think of you know, stuff that happened a, a hundred years ago, it you know really is not that long ago in the cultural imagination. Uh, recall how period maps suggest medieval people's sensitivity to being marginal or central. So we've got Jerusalem at the center of the map and then um, lots of weird and interesting stuff on the the margins. How can you be both marginal and you know, claim that you're exceptional without being quote unquote like too exceptional, like i.e. you know wild um, or monstrous. England is on the periphery of Europe, so um, it's an isolated culture um, throughout medieval history. It's always a little bit quote unquote um, behind, so it's Christianized kind of late. Uh, Later on, the um, printing press comes to England a little bit later than the rest of Western Europe. Uh, developments that happened during the Renaissance happen on the continent and come to England a little bit later. Um, same thing with the Protestant Reformation. Um, they're you know, always aware that they're a little bit kind of quote unquote out of step with what's happening on the continent. Uh, and it's not the world power that it is um, today. If you think about it, yeah, the English language is spoken all over the world today, uh, but at the time, it's only spoken in this tiny island that's um, you know, not much bigger than any given you know, state in the United States. So can it ever be a quote-unquote world power and a major player at the table? So a Latin tongue twister word at the head of this slide, laudabiliter. What does that mean? Maybe you see the word loud as in applaud or if you graduate uh, magna cum laude um, with high honors this suggests what this word is about adrian the fourth serves as pope from 1154 until his death in 1159 and even until today he is the only english pope in history ever so this is true now um, many centuries later in 1155, he addresses a papal letter, laudabiliter, to King Henry II, the king who sends Gerald of Wales uh, to the mission on the mission to Ireland about three decades later. Laudabiliter, praiseworthily, is the first word of this letter. And what is this praiseworthy subject that the Pope is addressing to the king? Uh, he explains that Ireland because it is so wild needs to be put into english hands for safekeeping um after this from this moment on and we have to think yeah uh, political affairs are uh, deeply tied up in inextricable ways with um religious affairs in ways that yes they still are today but in a completely different way in the middle ages uh kings for 400 years are known as the Lord of Ireland. So this has a um, pretty lasting political consequence, this laudabilitaire um, letter that um, Pope Adrian IV um, gives to King Henry II. Roman conquest, so of course I mean of Ireland, uh, it, it seems like the English uh, occupation of Ireland is uh, in part a ploy for Rome to um, bring Ireland under its domain. So uh, as I say there, don't be too quick to blame the English or Pope Adrian's Englishness for this imperialist act toward Ireland. Um, popes had encouraged English conquest of Ireland for about a hundred years. Uh, so yeah, why is this? So Ireland on the one hand is even today known for its 
deep Catholic piety. Uh, the Isle of Saints and Sages really sums up its identity throughout the Middle Ages, but uh, it always did things a little bit differently. And in part, uh, because of its geographic remove from the rest of Western Europe. So for centuries, the Celtic Christian church used uh, alternative math to calculate the date on which Easter should be celebrated. And uh, in fact, this had everything to do with their geographic remove. Um, Easter um, was and is um, in most varieties of Christianity celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon in the spring equinox. But uh, when exactly that would happen would be different if you were in different places in the, the world. So I'm not going to um, get out a, a map and a protractor and a calculator to explain why that is. But yeah, this is um, a like a very big controversy that um, waged in the seventh century between the Irish church and um the head of the um, Catholic Church in in Rome, and indeed the rest of Christendom, which, cel which celebrated uh, Easter according to Roman uh, customs, uh, but it has everything to do with their you know, physical geographic remove, not just their desire to say, oh well, we want to celebrate Easter at a different time to um, you know be different and exceptional and and strange. Uh, so hopefully this little lecture sets you up. Um, to begin reading Gerald of Wales's text and to see, yeah, how do, is he working for the English powers that be to uh, describe Ireland in a way that is marginal and not marginal in a good way, like marginal in a strange and dangerous and even monstrous way.